uh, from Navy Co. Oyster Company and uh, talking a little bit about uh, how you have dealt with and what some of the things that you're interested in with Harmful Algal Group. Yep, yep, sure. Thank you very much. And uh, thanks everybody for being there. I'm sorry I'm not there in person, but doing my day job up in D.C. And uh, hey, thank you for a very informative talk. That was it's nice to see that. And we look forward to continuing to hear how that evolves. As Bill said, I'm with Navy Cove Oyster Farm. Our farm is three miles from the mouth of Mobile Bay on the Fort Morgan Peninsula. We started playing around with this with Bill's help in 2011 as a farm, although uh, John Supain and I have a long history of experience in, uh, in farming oysters from the research side. We started marketing our product in 2013, and our production now is approaching 200,000 oysters per year. So we're a small farm by many standards, but we're growing, and it's, uh, it's really exciting to do this. Um, I want to talk first about regulations. Um, they touched on this, uh, and it may be repetitive, and I think Byron's around. If not, I'm sure we can check with him to make sure it's correct. But from the farmer's perspective, we understand that when Brevortia hits 5,000 cells per liter anywhere in the state, that, that's basically when it touches the Alabama side of the Alabama-Florida border. The state's required to shut us down, and we just heard Dave talking about that. Once uh, the cell counts at benchmark stations that are collected by ADPH and ADEM fall below, all of them fall below 5,000 cells per liter, uh, ADPH will collect tissue samples of oysters from us. Up to this point, they've used the mouse assay. It takes a few days, uh, and if that mouse assay comes back negative, they'll open us back up. And as a farmer, we're particularly pleased that uh, ADPH working with the FDA are making some really proactive changes by preparing to run the ELISA analysis. That'll make a huge difference, and it actually will be a local talent, uh, time permitting, uh, instead of the mouse assay. Another really uh, useful uh, tool, although we couldn't do it this last closure, ADPA will allow farms to batch test prior to harvest. So currently, as a farmer, we can test the batch using a certified lab uh, employing the mouse assay, and we are looking forward to when ELISA comes online. If that's negative, we can harvest that batch, and then we need to do it again for the next batch. So if we run the test on Monday and Tuesday, we get to go ahead, we can run out and harvest. And I'm not real sure what the time window is at, but it's really harvest by harvest. And again, an important point I'll get to towards the end is it must be done by a certified lab. Uh, Pseudonitia is a little different if it gets up over a million cells per liter and it tends to be farther offshore. Uh, if that shows up in the growing areas, they'll test the bloom for toxin production prior, prior to closing. So Pseudonitia is a pretty interesting um, critter. It, uh, it doesn't necessarily produce a toxin when it's blooming, but and I know the research is working on that switch. Um, it, we have had three half-related closures in five years, so as they pointed out, it is happening more frequently and the intensity seemed to be increasing. Uh, the first closure, we were out of products, so it really didn't bother us, but I know it hurt a lot of the farms and the early farms in Mobile Bay uh, prior to 1960, I mean, prior to 2016. And then we had two closures when we had ample products, so it did affect us financially. Um, closure creates not only our inability to sell, so it stops the um, uh, cash flow, but it also creates two supply chain interruptions. One is there's a perception of contaminated product, that, that information that they talked about and Byron has to do and Adam has to do when they close the bay, uh, they have to close swimming areas, it, it becomes common knowledge that this algal, algal bloom is there, so then people are all concerned that the product is contaminated. When that happens, um, and while we are closed, obviously those boutique oyster bars that want to sell our product and others, uh, they'll backfill after we've established a market, they'll backfill from other, stuff, other sources, and the farmer needs to break back into that market. That, that's always a uh, challenge, and it requires good communication and education. Fortunately, we have learned to prepare and manage around this to some extent. I know in the prior session you had a presentation on the half shot system. Missy was just talking about it uh, before the break. Um, I've known about this evolving toolbox since it was created, and I check it weekly, this time of year particularly, uh, moving into the fall and into the winter. I looked at it yesterday, uh, and there are several loads, levels of samples uh, that and low by that mapping system is 1 to 10,000, so low will shut us down. 
And those hot spots are just south of Tampa and off of Port St. Joe. The closest positive hit was off of Destin, so this kind of sets up our alerts. It was designated as a lower area, again, one of the 10,000 sites per meter on May 29th, but three days later it was gone. So it shows you how fast moving and ephemeral these blooms can be, which Dave spoke to. So we've used that tool to watch the bloom that began last summer off, Florida, off Tampa, moved into uh, up the coast as the winter progressed and it spread north into the panhandle. We knew it was coming in. As it was getting closer, as David said, that they alerted the buyer and buyer lets us know, and we're watching the uh, abscess uh, chart. Um, we were able to store market size oysters, which we can do in the wintertime, to meet two or three weeks supply. They go into the cooler, they're hot at about 37, 38 degrees, and it kept our market supplied, uh, and we didn't lose that income. Um, to give you an idea of the timing, Byron warned off on November the 9th, and predicted correctly, and we were closed on the 13th. So we had that window. We were closed until December the 7th, and then the opens us back up after the uh, tissue samples came back uh, toxin-free. And then we were closed due to the battery steam plant level a week later. So we had three weeks of closure, then we were open for a week, and then we were closed for another three weeks. So you can see how this stacks up. Uh, it was really nice because ADPH and ADEM both shared their sampling data as it was collected, so it really kept us informed, which is really all we can ask, just to know what's happening when. Regarding the future, I think, unfortunately, the frequency, as I mentioned and Dave mentioned, the intensity is going to go up with development and climate changes. I think it's going to become um, uh, a more common event. It used to be every 10 years, and now we're seeing it every two or three years. But the good news is that in Alabama, ADPH, the Marine Resources, and ADAM have been great leaning forward to try and figure out ways to provide advanced notice of shut down and are willing to discuss acceptable adjustments to current management plans that are acceptable to the FDA for having a little bit more micromanagement of the conditions and the spatial continuity of them. So uh, I think the challenge is moving forward and Bill asked us to give you a list of things to think about. One is that we're excited Eliza tests are coming online but it's going to require that those be certified labs and Certified labs are a difficult thing for all laboratories to achieve. You have to use certain techniques. You have to have certain standards, uh, QAQC and uh, custody chain of custody forms. Uh, and there is not a great deal of incentive for certified labs to pop up at universities. So we're delighted that uh, ADPH is going to set up to do that. But as an industry, uh, we can't flood them with samples, so they're going to have to be selected. It would be nice to get some commercial labs online that can be certified to do that testing. Um, another suggestion I had was continuity across state agencies to quantify Revorsia. <clears throat> ADEM samples, ADPH samples, sometimes marine resources samples, but their techniques are not always done in a way to be approved for closures and opening, but they can be used to monitor. So we would certainly encourage that there be greater continuity in those techniques. So Byron's agency is comfortable using other agency data to make decisions. <clears throat> Can, uh, um, we just heard Dave talking about a bloom in state waters does not mean that a bloom is in the farming area. In fact, I don't think we've ever seen level of toxin levels, uh, much less I mean, cell levels, much less toxin levels measured in at least our farm that were above the uh, cutoffs and levels of concern. Revorsia doesn't like fresh water. Lower salinities will kill it. So I guess the question is, can we work to tune closures based on spatial conditions like Florida does? They may open at Perdido Bay closed, but not have another Bay closed. And then can we, can we tune closures and openings based on salinity? I think we have data on the life history of Revorsia. We know if the salinity drops down to five or eight, which it is right now near our farm, uh, Bravorsha will not survive there. So we want to maybe learn more about that. Um, uh, I, I think we also are very concerned about the long-term threat of extended blooms. As David mentioned, um, the bloom off of Tampa went on and on for months, and something like that in Mobile Bay would be devastating to the industry because you got oysters that uh, are getting too big, you're younger coming up online, you don't have room for them, and your market's drying up. So 
Uh, I think that's just a reality, and that's why we need to do a better job of micromanaging. And finally, I wanted to mention, uh, and we've talked about this before in the governor's panel for, uh, for aquaculture, uh, for farming oysters, um, is public education about level of safety and risk, particularly for oyster gardeners. We have a lot of uh, people who have docks, dock owners who buy a few cages from available sources. They come to us and buy two or 3,000 seed and grow them for personal consumption, and they're not in the ADPH notification pipeline. We know they're sharing their oysters with their friends, staying within harvest regulations, but all it's going to take is one unfortunate, perhaps uneducated incident to create a bad rap for the industry. And somehow, Byron, if you're there, we've talked about this. Somehow we need to have a, a way where a, a person who has a dock that wants to grow oysters simply informs a state agency and centralize the information that they're doing that so they know that they're in an area that's been closed due to a, a algal bloom or a sewer spill even. So just wanted to mention that. But Bill, that's all the comments I have. I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay, are you able to stay on the line for a little while? Because we have another speaker if you're able to stick yeah. around. Okay, all right, we're gonna put you on mute then and we'll uh, come back to you after the end. Thank you, Chuck. Great, I'll uh